When I met him, he was here in the punishment block, a place he was more than familiar with. Steve was known as the Robin Hood of the prison system, forever confronting authority, forever in trouble. So you were given a minimum of 25 years to serve? A minimum of 25 years. And how many years have you done? I'm going to be 12 years now. Yeah. Can you describe those 12 years to me in some way? Well, uh, that's hard, really. I mean, I've never stopped fighting the system. You know, I've done most of it in solitary. You know, practically nearly all of it, you know, in solitary. And plus, you know, I've had an interlude in between time, two years in, in Broadmoor. You know, so it's been pretty, you know, been very, very hard indeed. You know, I mean, uh, I've been fighting the system now for nearly 12 years and I can't see any let up at all. And there's times when I get depressed, really depressed. You know, and you're only, you're, you're only a, an inch away from blowing. So I think, well, I get a tot of this, a tot, and that calm me down, you know. How have you blown up and wrecked your cell over the oh, years? Oh, I've lost count hundreds of times, I should think. But I will say, but it must be over a hundred times. I can honestly say that. Yeah, I have, I have wrecked myself completely. Not only myself, but um, the landings, as you can see out there, you know, are completely gone. Can you see yourself surviving these next 13 years? I doubt it. I doubt it. Very much. Unless there's a dramatic change in attitudes with the, at the Home Office and these people, you know, I'm given a fresh start somewhere else, you know. That's the only thing I can envisage at the moment. You told me you wouldn't survive in prison. I, 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 that, that time I, I thought I wouldn't. I was in the indications that I wouldn't survive. I was convinced. But a lot has happened since then. Yeah. Now I've got hope. When you told me 20 odd years ago, I had no hope whatsoever. I was in a mire. You told me you'd always taken the system on. You'd always been a rebel. Yeah, uh, Is that true against the system? Do you remember you uh, telling me that? I was a rebel, yeah. I was still a bit of a rebel in me now. Still something left, is there? Uh, uh, but why were you so anti-authority? Why did you hate the prison system as much as you did? I didn't go into prison hating it. That's what they made me. When I first came into prison, um, I was continually in trouble, continually in trouble. And then, um, well, they, they can't control you with the physical aspect of it in them days. When I say physical, I mean the beatings. They kind of control you, you know. And then so they start the drugs, you know. It's, you know, and they used to come into the cell deck, maybe, I still remember, they only did it a few months ago, you know, inject you, you know. And I say, hey, no, 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 no. Well, you can't, you refuse. They just jump on you, inject you, and that's it, leave you like that. You know, you, you've got no... You, what can you do? You can't say nothing, you can't, you know, I've had MPs on the job, I've had my family kicking up, you know, they still do it, you know, the liquid cush over the years, you just can't do nothing, and of course it affects you permanently. I tried to hang myself on. You tried to hang yourself? Uh, the, door, the sheet snapped. The sheet snapped on the door. And bought myself, I thought, well, what am I doing, what am I doing? I didn't have to go to hospital. Um, but um, they come in and just injected me and saved me, strong to two chairs, watching me. And um, you got a few officers talking you over it, you know. Next time you give it a job. They were joking. <laughs> yeah. Steve is 49, on medication and living in a secure part of the hospital. In 31 years, his entire adult life, he's been out of prison for only one day, for the funeral of his mother. The rest of the time, he's been in prisons, special hospitals, and confined to his cell. So Steve, try and make me imagine what it was like to survive in solitary. What did you do? Well, I, I took an artificial world around me. Um, the danger was, 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 I didn't realise then that it would come reality. I wouldn't tell the true conviction. 
You couldn't tell the truth from people. Really no. In memory, my first studio kit was the first salt, as it was a pill. And I got bread and water, and I made bread and water. And 56 days CC, so you can buy me. Just a boy to sleep on, no, no, no mattress. You know, a canvas sheet about that, so you can't really work up to hang yourself. And um, I, did t I got a year CC at Wakefield. I had to live like that for a year. Artificial, yeah. you know, daylight like got in there. So a dark cell. Dark cell. Yeah. What, um, what kept you going through all these confrontations? Um, uh, uh, it has its happened. It's just pure hatred. Hatred. What drove this hate? Where did this hate come from? Of authority. When I was in Jones on VBS and things, you know, you know, they sent me like, just set me off the rails. I was told nobody would touch me again, do not shout at me or look at me. I thought of quieting that down, I don't listen that down now. I could have an argument and not go away and fight about it. You know, I could have a good argument and not, not think of anything to do with anything. Get me in trouble. Yeah. So, what regrets in the end? Final question. What regrets do you have about your life? I would like to live it again. <laughs> um, a lot of regrets, really. A lot of regrets. But what's done is done, and can't be undone now. You only learn from it. I long for me freedom. Um, it's always been a dream. In London, when you filmed me last time, the dream didn't exist. Uh, and the dream is to convince me can become reality. Look, look at this. Look out the window. What do you see? No, station talking about it. Yeah, you can't move. Yeah. Yeah. Trees, fields, golf course. Uh, even the cat, the cats I see each day out playing outside. Um, I see hawks. The ducks are nesting in the ground. You get the ducks in the ground. Um, yeah. I, I can be trusted to go out now. I'm going on chop leaves shortly. One of the longest I've heard. Uh, it's people in their doing life, but um, what's the life? What's the life sentence? How do you find out? How do you count? It's what's those people than me that have come and gone. These are paintings that uh, I've done for a, a charity. They're going to be auctioned in November. They're, they're all reproductions, either from prints or photographs. This one is the red boy after Sir Thomas Lawrence. Uh, this one here particularly appeals to me because you know, I can see a lot of beauty in it and there isn't a lot of that in this place at all. I originally met Ken in the Braille unit at Wormwood Scrubs Prison when he was busy making books for the blind. Ken had been given a life sentence for manslaughter, for killing a man with a hammer after drinking heavily. My father died while I'd been in prison and nobody had told me. So I went back to my hometown and I couldn't stay at my mother's because I'm the black sheep of the family. So I went to stay with this chap who had invited me to stay with him. But one of the conditions of my staying there was that I indulged in homosexual activities with him. And uh, I couldn't respond because I'm not homosexual. I didn't hold it against him because he was. But there was a masochistic side to his homosexuality, which I found it very hard to handle. And I was only there three days, and I was due to leave the next day. And we had a serious argument, a serious argument about his life and about my life, because they were both in wrecks, because he'd been married and I'd been married. And we were arguing, and I, I threatened him. And he said, and I said, I'll let you if you don't, if you don't stop. 
And he said, now I want you, didn't he? And he planted the seed and the seed grew. He went through to the bedroom and uh, it's pretty frightening now even talking about it, I've got to admit it. And uh, I, he called me through and I, was in the, and I went through to the kitchen and I picked up a hammer that was on the side. I've lived that night a thousand times and as far as I can remember, I was going to threaten him with it. That and no more. But somewhere between the kitchen and the, the bedroom, I went over the top. He saw me come in. He saw, he must have known what I was about to do and either through shock or fear or both, he just lay there. And uh, I struck him with a hammer on the head. I never, I never heard any sound at all. I never heard anything. I, I felt alienated from it, if you like. It was almost as though I was standing back and watching somebody else do it. I felt a great deal of fear, but I couldn't relate to the situation at all. It, I, I was alien from it. Anyway, I, I hit him more than once. I don't know how many times I hit him. And I heard a crashing sound. I thought it, it sounded like a vase smashing, but it was his skull hitting the wall. The one thing I can never forget is the smell, because his, his brains were exposed. In fact, they were over the wall and the bed and the floor and me. And I, I wanted to run. I wanted to get away. But I couldn't leave him. I was fighting for his life and I, I couldn't leave him. That was it. So I went back next door and I picked up the phone and I, I phoned the police. I said, I've just killed somebody. Since I filmed Ken 20 years ago, he's been out of prison twice. Ken, like all lifers on release, is given a license to live in the community. A condition of Ken's license was to control his drinking, which he failed to do on both occasions. Tomorrow, he's being released on license for the third time. It's his last night in jail. Ken, this is uh, your last night in the cell. Yes, it certainly is. That's why it's so bare, because I've got rid of all my personal belongings. I've depersonalised it for the next person that's coming in tomorrow. So, uh, yes. This particular cell has been my home for the last nine months. Is it? Yes. D describe it to us. Tell us what you've been doing in this cell. What have I been doing in it? Yeah. Watching television, drinking tea, smoking, thinking about things. Worrying about things, um, wondering what was going to happen, whether I would be released or whether I'd be kept in, and um, you know, just just general things that everyone else worries about. I'm affected by items on the news the same as everyone else, and uh, it's been a traumatic few months actually. Part of a life sentence is served in prison, and part of it served outside prison. But of course, it can be the license can be revoked at any time. You don't have to commit an offence to be recalled to prison. Well, so why should they recall you? Well, because their, their overriding concern is protection of the public. And if they think that your behavior is in any way um, returning to high risk factor, what they consider high risk factor, things to do with the original index offense. For instance, mine, to a certain extent, was drink related. And therefore, because I was, in their eyes, drinking too much, then it was a cause for concern. And um, I was returned to prison. I just cannot come back. There won't be any more chances. You know, I, I have to, I have to um, you know, say again that I haven't committed any offences while I've been in the community, but because of the concerns over my drinking, this is where I am. And it, it takes something as simple as that, but as, as powerful as that, to bring you back. And I, 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 don't have any, I don't have that choice anymore. When you think about the crime, Ken, yes. as must do. Yes. Have you changed as, in your opinion as to why it happened and what made you do it? Yeah, I, 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 I understand it completely differently than I did at the time. Um, the man I killed was, was a masochistic homosexual. And it's quite obvious to me now that at the time of the index offence, 
I had concerns about my own sexuality. I had concerns about homosexuality. I was homophobic, but I was homophobic at a, at a deep subconscious level. And it took, and, but I wasn't conscious of it on the surface. Um, I have to say that, I, you know, I, I, I no longer have a problem with that, but it took a long time for me to, to unravel it. I was a dangerous man at the time of the index offence. There's, there's no doubt about that. But I haven't been a, for the want of a better word, a dangerous man for a long, long time now. That, that passed a long time ago, but it, it took a long time to, to reach that point. You don't think you could commit such a crime again? Well, no. I mean, you can't... Um, you, to, to understand something to any great depth, to be able to undo that understanding in order to be at that point again, um, I, I can't see how that can happen. Are you ready, Ken? All right, boss, yeah. Fine. So, this is it? It is, yes. Didn't have much sleep, I'm afraid, but, you know, the day's finally arrived. How do you feel? I feel OK, I'm just tired. I mean, I, I don't think it's because I'm getting out. It's because, you know, we were talking last night about the last 20 years and, you know, your mind starts to race, you're trying to put things in perspective. So, yes, it's, uh, I'll be all right. Yeah, I'm going to wear that, that, and the underpants and the socks. Right. Yeah, and I'll put the rest in this bag in. If I can just ask you the same and do at the bottom. I'm just copy. I'm just copy. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and I've just got to give you a license now. Okay. Ken. Okay. Yeah, thanks a lot, boss. No, you won't see me again. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you. Cheers. <clears throat> Which way is it, boss? Up this way? Many lifers now stay in a hostel on their release. They're helped in the search to find work and a home of their own. Ken has been here for five months. Something's definitely changed. I've got a different perception in many things. Why it's happened now, I can't honestly say, but, uh, you know, <clears throat> but it triggered something anyway. It triggered a response in me. The that, second yeah, yeah, it triggered a response in me that I've, you know, that this can't go on. I believe I've made the progress I've made because I'm not choosing to drink. I'm not told you cannot drink, although that is an agreement I've got at the hostelier, but I made the decision not to drink. I wasn't told you can't drink because how are they going to police it? You have to police it. You have to police yourself when you're unlicensed. And uh, I just made the decision not to drink. And I've made a lot of progress, and therefore maybe I've made the right decision. And um, I certainly didn't make this much progress when I was out for the five and a half years. That has to be said. I mean, when you get up in the morning and you look forward to going to work, then you know you're doing the right job, don't you? And that's, I've been on this work experience for four weeks and that's how I've felt ever since day one. I mean, I actually look forward to going to work and, you know, the only time that happened to me before was when I worked on the rigs in the 70s, but well, I'm too old for that now. But, um, yeah, th this, this has been a tremendous experience. I, I absolutely love it. I was in my room in 
that hostel one night. And just for a second, just for a split second, I was watching something on the telly, so I was preoccupied. And just for a second, I thought I was back there. Just for a second. And then it passed. That's scary. Yes. Yeah, just for a second. Yeah, that's all it took. We live in a civilised country, whatever people like to say, and, and, and pe you are, people do give you a chance. Ordinary people do give you a chance. Uh, and if you mess up, then obviously it's down to you, you know, and some people might give you a second chance, but uh, that's difficult to say. No, I just want people to accept me as I am now, basically. You know, and if people are comfortable with that and they're happy with that, then, then I'm happy too. I'm just relieved relieved and grateful to be to be out again <clears throat> it's almost a quarter of a century now rex it's a long time isn't it yeah it never completely goes away The, um, the knowledge of, of what happened all those years ago, it never completely goes away. I feel OK about talking about it, but I think it's reaching a point where the talking has to stop. Thank you.